for today. So for, for the audience as a whole, the question and answer um, thread is open. And um, for people in the room here also, um, uh, I, I welcome uh, comments and questions. I'm gonna just pause for a second. I have some things that I'm curious about, but I'm gonna uh, let, uh, see, see if anything comes in for a moment. Um, uh, Anna first. Um, I just wanted to make a comment and ask a question to Alicia. Um, we know that the 2020 census um, undercounted some marginalized communities. Um, and how will that reflect on the way we um, gather data from um, you know, Black, non-Hispanic, Hispanic communities and other uh, smaller communities? Thanks, Anna. That's a really um, important question. Um, so the, the 2020 census is distinct from the CPS, but it, of course, is kind of feeds into a lot of federal surveys because it helps to create sampling frame and things like that. And, and I don't even know the intricacies of all of those <laughs> interrelationships. But of course, um, undercounting groups is a concern, and that's why we're doing the the non-response bias studies to try to get a sense of, of the impact on food security measures. Um, and I think, you know, overall we saw a decline in, in response related to, the, we assume related to the pandemic in 2020. Um, you know, I hope that that will recover because of course the concern is that we are really trying to reach um, the households that are hardest to reach, you know, low income households, the most transient and, you know, those are that are most vulnerable to food security. So I don't know that I have a, a really great answer for your question, but, but I think, you know, we are mindful of it and it's something that um, it is certainly important moving forward and not just for the food security module, but across the federal school system. Great. Great question and uh, uh, interesting response. And the um, so my my first question, I've got a question about um, sort of the survey questions themselves, and then a question about scaling and analysis tools. And the question about survey methods themselves, I feel like in different ways, close reading of the questions has come up throughout the day today. Uh, just for example, it comes up in the presentation by McLean and and Johnson about cognitive testing. You have to really read and, and listen to people about what's going on. And it was interesting for me to hear, Alicia, that there's um, more going on with that that I, that I look forward to, to reading. Um, the discussion of the balanced meals question has to do with closely reading what are, what are people understanding and what, what is the um, definition. When, when Nguyen analyzes differential item response, um, that also is about essentially close reading of the question. The, the issue with differential item response in plain English is whether the relative frequency of answering the different questions changes across different population groups. So of course, some, some population groups answer these questions more frequently than others do because some population groups face more severe hardship than others do. But this question of differential item response is, is like, are there particular questions that are relatively more frequently answered affirmed in some populations than in others. Another, another area where close reading of the questions came up that I mentioned before is in, in Ana Poblacion's um, discussion of threshold questions. And finally, um, in the final presentation today, uh, uh, where just thinking about why not ask the losing weight question of, of adolescents. And I don't know the story behind that, but, but it stands to reason that it could be, be because of related to concerns about having that particular set of words be related to people's concern about body image or um, uh, concern about un unhealthy weight loss um, might, might be connected to why don't we ask adolescents uh, uh, a particular question about, about losing weight. Um, so uh, what, what, what are, um, to what extent should we be reading these questions this literally, or to what extent should we 
be um, uh, thinking of them as just a window on an un under underlying scale score. And so I don't know if anybody has 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 reflection on this. And there's no right or right wrong answer 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 to this. But it was something that I was sort of thinking about throughout the day as we listened to these different different presentations. Park, I think that's a really interesting point. If I may jump in, I think I had in my notes to talk about this, but I'm not actually sure that that I did. But in our cognitive testing, you know, the the balanced meal question has gotten the most sort of criticism over the years and I think you know not not on place because it's it's you know difficult to understand what people mean by balanced meals and in 2007 we had done a split sample and tested nutritious meals and it didn't work very well because um, it sort of changed the the Roche measurement components of the model and in cognitive testing this this last round we tried testing a healthy meals question um, and it seemed to be measuring a different construct. So some people talked about organic foods or name brand foods or these other things that we weren't really, you know, trying to get information about. Um, and it is, uh, you know, we have the tension of, of trying to measure food security well, but then also, you know, we think that this long time series is important so that we don't necessarily want to cause a break in it. So at one point, you know, is it worth sort of changing the measure for for that that might cause that break in the time series? Um, so that's just one point I wanted to make, and you can find that in the in the census report on cognitive testing about the healthy meals um, question that we asked about. Um, the other thing um, that I wanted to bring up, I've I've listened to some of the interviews um, from the Census Bureau, um, and I've always been impressed by how quickly people answer. I think when people are going through the actual survey, they, it, you know, people answer quite quickly. And, and these issues, if you're experiencing food insecurity, I think are quite salient. Um, and of course it's different in, the, in a cognitive interviewing context because I've listened to some of those as well to get people to sort of stop and think and, and really sort of digest and think about how they're answering the question. And I, um, I appreciate the the detail with which people are approaching cognitive interviewing because I think it's really important. So thanks. Great. The 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 um question about about sort of reading these questions liter these items literally and about cognitive testing is is um in some ways the flip side of thinking about how do we use these analysis tools to um, understand the ex extent and severity of the prevalence and severity of, of household food security, food insecurity. Um, several of the analysts used not the Roche model, but the moderately more complex um, models that have that have more parameters. Essentially, it's a more flexible functional form. All, all, all of the models that are most commonly used in this area of work belong to the family of logistic regression models that where we're looking to see how does the extent of food security increase the log odds that people will affirm particular survey items? It's, it's like a transformation of the probability that they'll affirm particular items. And um, once you, once you um, no longer have the simplicity of, of the Roche model, then the um, severity how how you know what are pe what's people's scale score? What's people's food insecurity score? Depends on which questions they affirm, and that makes it somewhat more difficult to explain uh, to explain to uh, policy audiences. I think uh, what does this really mean? Because because I often find myself under pressure to explain this in a way that not just a statistician would love, but that really makes intuitive. What level of hardship are we talking about? And so I like being able to refer to particular numbers of affirmed responses or particular um, particular survey questions that are the threshold questions. And it feels like a uh, uh, it feels uh, maybe it gives me a little sadness um, uh, if 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 it's if if we require more technical training and statistics to understand the measures. Um, I don't know if a couple of the different people who estimated these two parameter models or other models that are more general than 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 the one parameter logistic have any comments about how, how do they do this? Um, uh, Christian, for example. 
I don't know if Christian, you were responding to this question or a different one. Yeah, I was. I I do um, I do remember that. And I'm, I apologize if there's background noise, um, but but um, there was Mark Mark Nor did publish a paper in which he said the two parameter model actually does better in terms of psychometric properties, but that difficulty in conveying it to the public um, was was a hurdle that that the the juice was not worth the squeeze of trying to explain all these parameters to a more general audience. And that, and, and, and that, that basically the, the, the advantage of doing it might be appreciated by, you know, stats geeks like ourselves, but probably not make a difference in how people, a meaningful difference in how well it, the, the whole idea was grasped. That, 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 that I, I, I find that persuasive. And um, it, it almost makes me, in some ways, not a true believer in the scaling, in the scaling models. Because once you've made this decision to value clarity of communication um, more than um, goodness of fit in a statistical sense, then, um, then it has a couple implications. Uh, it means one's relying, I feel, I'm not confident in my views on this, but it means one's relying more on common sense and straightforwardness of language than one's relying on statistical properties. And once you've made that decision, then I think consistency of instrument is really important because um, uh, maintaining the same instrument over time, if we think of food security as, um, as a summary of you know, these different experiences of hardship, um, we know how to uh, interpret it if we ask the same questions each round, but it's harder to know what to do. It's harder to know what one's doing if, if the questions are changed. And it makes it more difficult, for example, to compare um, one instrument to another. Um, uh, Anna has a question about the losing weight question. And so let's return to that for a moment. Well, it, it's less than a question, but more than a comment. Um, I want to remind our everyone that food security, um, before we had the scales, it was um, measured indirectly with, um, you know, anthropometry. You know, if you were emaciated or you know malnourished, then you would like you would likely be food insecure. And other indirect measures, um, you know, took place at that time. But when we had the um, food security scale. It, it made sense to enter a question that, you know, did you lose weight because you didn't have money to buy food. But with the nutrition transition and with the ultra processed foods, I think this question is kind of currently making less sense. And uh, just as an anecdote, um, Brazil, the country I'm from, uh, you uh, validated the, the HFSSM to Portuguese and did all the psychometric um, and um, we dropped this question because of it, it doesn't really uh, fit into the, the, the current context of the world. I, I think with current nutrition un understanding and also with the long history of analyzing covariates of uh, food security, um, that question probably would, would be done differently if it were being done from scratch from scratch today. Um, David, what is your thoughts? Oh, I, I want to go back to you know, using uh, the simpler uh, scale and uh, just a, you know, uh, taking on the Roche assumptions, even if they're not uh, quite correct. I think in our study, we sort of had a worst case analysis in the term in terms of, uh, you know, we, we, we pretty soundly rejected uh, the Roche uh, assumptions. Uh, you know, we, we've got scales with very different uh, discrimination parameters. And those scales were still 91% correlated with the fanciest scale uh, that we could uh, develop. So I don't think that you're losing too much communications wise, uh, but you know, there are other things that you can do so as, uh, you know, as quantitative uh, scientists, uh, we can adopt other models when we estimate things. So you know, Matt Rabbit uh, 
you know, uh, some time ago, you know, took uh, the relatively simple, uh, you know, food security scale and re-estimated that uh, using a behavioral uh, Roche model. Uh, and, you know, his work uh, can be extended to, you know, estimate uh, behavioral uh, two-parameter models. So we can save that for, you know, the econometric analyses or the psychometric uh, analyses. The advantage of uh, using all of those parameters is that you really are using all the uh, data. You should be getting much more efficient uh, estimates. Uh, so, you know, for getting uh, really precise relationships, you can do that over on the quantitative side. But then when you do the uh, reporting, uh, you know, reporting based on a uh, simpler uh, scaling of the measures, and, um, you know, as you said, a more explainable uh, scaling of uh, measures uh, works pretty well. So, so let, let me just follow up a second. Because efficiency, you know, every, again, this is a statistical term of art, but it just means your standard errors are smaller, that you're able to measure things more, more precisely. And the, um, the thing is, I think the efficiency is efficiency if you're trying to measure a particular food security score, right? So if you're fairly sure that, that the underlying score is a particular number that you're trying to estimate for each household, then, then it's more efficient if you use more of the information. Um, and uh, it does require not thinking of these as being diverse questions. Don't you think that somebody who reading the questions literally thinks of these as being a collection of interesting topics of, of loosely related food hardships? Um, uh, should somebody who, who reads these questions that way prioritize efficiency? In other words, how much, how much should we um, value that, that efficiency gain? Uh, the efficiency gain becomes really important for certain types of uh, questions. Uh, so for instance, if you're taking a look at outcomes for children, where it's much less frequent uh, that hardships are gonna be reported for children, you know, the extra efficiency and the extra power that you get from uh, the additional variation uh, becomes uh, important. Uh, you know, the additional variation can help you overcome uh, some problems. Uh, so, uh, over, you know, using uh, the latent scale instead of a simple summative uh, measure, you know, can help you uh, overcome sample separation problems and other problems uh, that uh, plague, uh, you know, analyses uh, where you have low incidence of uh, outcomes. Uh, and, you know, given the profession's uh, tendency to confound uh, statistical and substantive significance, something uh, that allows you uh, to be more efficient, uh, more precise, be able to, uh, you know, uh, draw tighter inferences, uh, you know, that's, that's an advantage. I, I, I guess the uh, thing that I'm arguing is that you can have it both ways. So you can have something uh, that you can report uh, relatively uh, simply, you can have a cosmopolitan type uh, food security uh, question that anybody can answer at home and calculate their own uh, food security score. Uh, but you can always come back with a better econometric analysis uh, that uh, is able to uh, distinguish uh, a little bit better. Great. I feel, I feel like I learned a lot from your, your comments on this. And um, it's, this is related to something Alicia brought up in her final comments, which was um, about the thinking through um, research and reflection on household food security measurement here at the 25th anniversary that really is feasible from the USDA perspective. And as we, as we had conversations with the grantees as they were preparing the papers, this was a theme um, for, the, for the, uh, th those conversations. And I feel very impressed with the grantees. In other words, I can see, I can see in the papers that were given both consideration of um, what is our tradition? What, what does our traditions miss? Um, but also recognizing that not every not everything missed means necessarily a change to the canonical food security measure, but rather sometimes it might mean we have to contemplate changes to the to the um, sort of the main food security measure. But many other times, um, it's something that people in the research literature should know about as they reflect on, on how do we interpret these results. 
um, it doesn't necessarily <laughs> it doesn't necessarily make Alicia's job more difficult. Um, uh, it it might well be um, just improving what light does this shine on the nature of food insecurity and hunger in the United States. Um, Alicia mentioned, and it really is true that, and the people who did the cognitive interviews must also have noticed, um, in fact, did report um, how poignant some of these questions are. Um, many years ago, I sat in, I think it's Hagerstown, Maryland, where the Census Bureau has their telephone call center, you know, with the earphones listening to these conversations and was struck that there's something humane about having the government, having the state want to know, want to know open-ended open -ended, uh, responses from people about how are we doing as a society. Um, it takes a certain amount of courage for a government to want to ask these questions uh, of people knowing that we're not really satisfied with the answer. Um, for many years, there's been hope that household food insecurity would drop substantially. In the 1990s, the goals that were adopted was to have food insecurity drop by half. And we haven't met those goals. And so this research conversation that we're part of here today is about something that's more than just research. It's about how we can have a better society with less hardship for those who have least. And so um, I want to congratulate everybody who's contributed to this conversation. I think it was both um, fascinating, but also important for the world we live in. Um, uh, Christian, please, please uh, share your thoughts. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mark. I, I don't really, I don't really have anything to say, especially um, given everything that's gone on in this conversation, especially at the end of the day. I think it's been fantastic, and I really appreciate the way that um, you and Irma have really brought together and. Um, just led this led this uh, effort to get this research together. Um, of course, Alicia has has been right there um, helping from the ERS side, and all all of our staff at ERS um, who have helped out. I know that uh, we're working on getting a, a special issue of a journal together for these papers. So I really want to thank Tim Park for working really hard on that. Um, and of course, I really, really want to thank all the researchers who have presented uh, really challenging um, and um, um, rigorous work today um, that really, really gives us a direction, to, gives us many directions to go in, in thinking about improving food security measure in the future. So really from, on behalf of ERS, I would just say thank you very much. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what everybody's work looks like at the end of the day. That's so true. And we're grateful. We're grateful for your support and, and for your participation. Um, people, people don't know, but uh, along with Alicia, Christian and uh, Matthew Rabbit have been, have been a source of advice and counsel to Irma and I. We sometimes set up a meeting just to, you know, not not on business, but just to ask their advice about the fundamentals of, uh, of food security research. Irma, do you have any last comments as we close out as we close out the session? No, I I, I was just thinking before a little bit about the um, how to think about food security and also thinking about um, the measures in public health. And sometimes, for example, when thinking about Hispanic populations, something uh, that that is uh, that has been shown is that. Um, they self-report that they have poorer health than what they really have. And I was just trying to relate that to the food security concept and, and how some research before uh, have found that for Latino immigrants, they don't like this wording of never, but instead hardly ever. But I was thinking that maybe it's not necessarily only for Latino immigrants, but it's in general for Hispanics, and that maybe this can help us to think about whether the summative measure uh, is not that relevant, but, but the categories, because in the categories, maybe we are going to put them exactly where they belong, but if we use the summative measure, not necessarily. So those, that was something I was thinking about, uh, uh, yes, as, as I was uh, hearing uh, the discussion, but thank you everybody. This was a really great discussion and um, it was great to work with all of you. Ter terrific. And we look forward to paper submissions in August. 
and uh, and then the and then the process of editing editing and revision in the fall. I'm um, very much look, looking forward to the to the special issue and following Will Masters' comments. It is now on my to do list to make sure that uh, that uh, in negotiations with the journal that there's no risk of uh, having special issues fall off the library subscriptions. Uh, that's now something that I hadn't previously been worried about, but now uh, now have on my task list. And so we 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 look forward to working with you all on that and are grateful for your participation. Nice to see everybody. Have a great Thanks, week. Park. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Have a good day.